Hey guys, welcome back to a new video. In this session I will explain everything you need to know about the surface of a spherical cap. We will be looking at both the theory side of things, where we derive an easy formula for this surface, starting from this general integration expression. And it will turn out that this surface can be written as 2 times pi times r times h. And if you're already familiar with this expression, or you simply are not interested in deriving it, you can skip right ahead to the application side of things, where we calculate the proportion of the Earth's surface that you will be able to see when you're hovering a specific height above it. We will compare two scenarios, one where you would be standing in the open ocean, and the other where you would be standing on the summit of Mount Everest. The timestamps for both these parts can be found in the comment section below. And with that, let's get into the theory part of things. The first thing that we need to do is to make clear what a spherical cap actually is. Let's say that we have a normal sphere, and we can draw one together with three Cartesian coordinate axes. An example of a spherical cap can be obtained by drawing a line parallel to the equator and then consider all of the surface of the sphere above this line. In this example, we've obtained a spherical cap at the south pole of this sphere. Now to derive the formula that we need to calculate such a surface, we will start from the general expression to calculate specific surfaces using integrations. What we will do now is to try and intuitively understand this expression. And I will also leave a link to another video where I mathematically derive this expression. However, now it's sufficient to just briefly touch on what these terms actually mean. And to do this, we again look at an example where we want to calculate the surface of this specific geometric object. The first thing that we need to note is that this surface is actually a specific example of a specific class of surfaces. And what is so special about this three-dimensional surface is that it can be obtained by taking this two-dimensional graph, which I draw in yellow, and which traces the outer edges of our three-dimensional surface. And if we would rotate this graph 360 degrees around the x-axis, we again get our three-dimensional surface. And it is exactly for these types of surfaces that this formula holds. Because in these cases, this yellow line can be represented by f of x, just any function in the x and f of x plane. So let's see how we then can make sense of this integration. Well, we see that we are integrating in the x direction, namely this direction, and therefore we're adding something along this axis. And what are we adding? Well, we're adding circles at each point along this x direction. And by adding all of the circumferences of these circles together, we eventually end up with the entire surface of our three-dimensional object. To calculate the circumference of each of these circles, we need of course to find the radius, because we know that the circumference of a circle is simply two pi times the radius of this circle. However, we also see that this radius of the circle is exactly the value f of x. And therefore, we see that this 2 pi times f of x is each time the circumference of this circle. However, we also see that f of x, the radius of this circle, changes if we go along the x direction. And this is exactly what this second term incorporates. This second term incorporates the fact that the length in this direction is actually curved which is also something that I treat in more detail in a video where I specifically derive this integral. However, at this point, it is clear that what we need in order to calculate this surface is exactly an expression for f of x, which we then can simply fill in in this integral. And let's now apply these insights to our spherical cap. To do this, we first again sketch our sphere and on it our spherical cap. Then, in order to apply this integration formula that we just treated, we need to find the two-dimensional figure which results in a three-dimensional sphere if we would revolve it around a symmetry axis. And for a sphere, this is quite straightforward, because the two-dimensional figure is simply a circle. We see that if we would revolve this circle around this x-axis, we would get back a sphere. And let's say that we have a sphere of radius r, which translates to our two-dimensional figure with a circle of radius r. 
how does the spherical cap then look like on this two-dimensional figure? Well, this will simply be this part of the circle. Because again, keep in mind that we have to rotate this circle 360 degrees around the x-axis. And this would mean that this surface right here would indeed result in a spherical cap. And let's denote this distance. So the distance from the surface of our circle to the other boundary of our cap, we denote as h. And if we now again look at what we had before and how this intuitively worked, this integral, what we now need is a function prescription for this piece right here. Well, of course, this is a function prescription for the entire circle. And we know that a circle is described by the formula r squared is x squared plus y squared. However, what we see here is that we want a function of f of x as a function of x. And in this case, it would be a function y as a function of x. And since this r is a constant, we still need to rewrite this equation to get y is a specific function of x. And what this actually means is that we want to get these distances right here because these are the distances that we will revolve around the x-axis to get our circles. But we see that this distance is actually the radius of the circles that we will be adding in order to get the total surface. It's basically these radii right here in our previous example. But as in our previous example, we see that these radii change with increasing x. And therefore, we need to have this distance, which is the distance y, as a function of x. And that is exactly what we will do right now. So if we rewrite this equation as a function of y, we simply get that y is equal to the square root of x squared plus r squared. And this, of course, will be our function of x, the function that will give us our surface by calculating this integral. Now note here that we still need to fill in these boundaries of this integral. So we are integrating over x, meaning in this direction. So what are the boundaries of our integral? Well, we start at h and we end at r. And therefore, we integrate from r minus h all the way up to r, since this distance right here is denoted as h. I know that previously I said that this point would be h, but that was actually a mistake. What I meant to say is that this distance between the point from which we are taking the spherical cap all the way to the end of the sphere is what we call h. And therefore, this point right here will actually be r minus h, the lower bound of our integral. And at this point, we are completely set. We have our function f of x, and we have our integral that we now can solve. So let's now calculate this integral. But before we do this, let me first correct a minus sign mistake that I made earlier. Here, of course, there has to be a minus sign in front of it because we are rewriting this equation as a function of y. And therefore, this plus x squared needs to go to the other side of the equality sign, which then, of course, becomes a minus x squared. So with that error corrected, let's now calculate this integral. We have 2 times pi multiplied by this integral from r minus h all the way up to r from f of x, which is the integral from r squared minus x squared, multiplied by the square root of 1 plus, and now we see that we have to take the derivative of x and then afterwards square it. Now, because our function is a simple square root, we can, of course, easily derive it. So we have 1 divided by 2 times the square root of r squared minus x squared, but now we still have to take the chain rule into account because here inside of the square root we have minus x squared and not simply x. So we still have to derive minus x squared to x, which then simply becomes minus 2x. And we have to square this entire derivative and take the square root and write the x. This becomes the following. We have again 2 pi, the integral from r minus h to r times the square root of r squared minus x squared, multiplied by the square root of 1 plus, and now we take this square right here. So we get 4x squared divided by 4 times r squared minus x squared and dx. Rewriting it even further, we get again 2pi times the integral of r minus h 
to r times the square root of r squared minus x squared multiplied with the following. We can cancel these two fours out and we put these two terms on an equal denominator. Well, this simply means that we have to multiply this term right here with r squared minus x squared. So we get the square root of r squared minus x squared plus x squared, which is this x squared, divided by the common denominator r squared minus x squared. We close the square root and we write dx. And at this point, we see that we can cancel out something major. We see that this square root in the enumerator can be cancelled out with this square root in the denominator. And this is because this square root right here can of course be split up to become a square root in the enumerator and a square root in the denominator. That doesn't change anything. So we can cancel out this term and this term. We see of course also that here in the denominator we have minus x squared plus x squared which also drops out. So what are we left with? Well, simply the square root of r squared. But the square root of r squared, well, is simply r. This means that our integral becomes 2 times pi times the integral of r minus h all the way up to r of r dx. But of course, r is independent of x, so it can be put outside of the integral. So this means that we're almost there. We have 2 pi multiplied by r times the integral from r minus h to r of dx. Now this is very simple. This simply becomes 2 times pi times r multiplied by the following, the upper bound minus the lower bound. And we see of course that here r minus r cancels out and we are left with 2 pi times r times h. And this is of course the surface of our spherical cap that we have now found a very easy formula for. And this brings us to part two, which is the application side where we're going to use this formula to calculate the proportion of the Earth's surface that we can observe when we are hovering at a specific height above the Earth's surface. And before we actually get into the calculations, let me first draw a drawing where I define all of the parameters. Let's again draw our spherical Earth. Now consider the point where you are hovering above the Earth as a point which we denote as W. And from this point, the proportion of the Earth's surface that you can see is of course determined by drawing the tangent lines from the surface of the Earth towards that point. And where these tangent lines touch the surface of the Earth, we denote with the points A and B. And these two points then determine the spherical cap that we can observe. It is bound by a circle that is parallel to the equator, here drawn in blue. If we then define the middle of our sphere, or the center of the Earth, with a point M, then we can connect the center of this Earth with a straight line towards the point where we are hovering. Now this straight line crosses several lines. One line that it crosses is the connection line between A and B. And this point right here we call D. Then another important point is where this line crosses the surface of the Earth. And this point we call C. Therefore we already see that this line between D and C will be the H in our formula that we found. It is the H that defines the extent of our spherical cap. And then of course the remaining length between the point at which we are hovering above the Earth's surface is of course capital H, which is denoted for the height at which we are hovering. And there is one more line that we will draw, which is the line connecting this point A with the surface of the Earth. And of course, since we know the Earth has a radius R, this line will also have radius R. And what we want to find now is this surface right here. And I will only draw this right now because it obstructs a lot of other parameters that we will need but just so you get the ID. And this surface, as we have just found, is equal to 2 times pi times r, which is the radius of the Earth, times h. And this h, as I already mentioned, is this length between c and d. And therefore, what we now need to find, of course, is an expression for this cd as a function of capital H, which is the height at which we are hovering above the Earth, and the other distance that we know is r, the radius of the Earth. 
Therefore, we need to find an expression for CD as a function of capital H and R. And at that point, we can easily calculate this surface. And in order to find this relation between CD and capital H and R, we focus our attention on the following triangle. We start at point W, we go all the way to this point A, then we cross the radius of the sphere all the way to the center of our sphere in point M, and then we go all the way up again to point W, passing point D and point C. So let me draw this triangle and note all of the important points on it. We have point A right here, the middle of our sphere in point M. We are hovering at point W. And from the construction of our figure, we know that point D lies at that place where the connection line between A and D makes a right angle with the connection line of M and W. On our initial figure, that would be this angle. And then at another point along the way, we come across point C. This means, of course, that this distance AM is the distance R. The distance between D and C is, of course, the distance small h, which is the distance that we are actually looking for. And we see that the distance WC is, of course, capital H. And at this point, we are done drawing and we can start calculating and doing some triangle geometry in order to find this distance h as a function of R and capital H. The first thing that we note is that we have three right angled triangles. We have this one, ADM, we have this right angled triangle, AWM, and we have of course this right angled triangle, AWD. Now for each of these right angled triangles, we can use the Pythagorean theorem, and this gives us the following relations. First, we look at the largest right triangle, AWM. For this one, we have that WM squared is equal to AM squared plus WA squared. Then we look at the smallest right angle triangle. And for this one, we have that AM squared is equal to DM squared plus AD squared. And then for the last right angle triangle, we have the following relations. We have that WA squared is equal to WD squared plus AD squared. And these relations all have to hold simultaneously. Let's now take these two letter equations. We see that AD appears in both of them. This means that we can combine both of them, substituting one in the other. We have that AM squared minus DM squared, where I put this dm squared on the other side of the equality sign is equal to ad. However, ad, we now use this ad, which is equal to wa squared minus wd squared by putting this one on the other side of the equality sign. So let's do that right now. So this becomes equal to wa squared minus wd squared. And in the next step, and in the next step, we use this first equation by substituting this wa squared for wm squared minus am squared by putting this am squared on the other side of the equality sign. So let's do that right now. So we have am squared minus dm squared is equal to wm squared minus am squared. And then of course we should not forget this last term here minus wd squared. Rearranging this a bit, we get 2 times am squared is equal to wm squared plus dm squared minus wd squared. And at this point, we seem to be stuck. However, if we look at all of these terms here, these are all lengths that are along this side of the triangle. We have WM, which is the long side of the triangle. We have DM, which is this side of the triangle, which is a piece of WM. And we have WD, which is the other piece of WM. So is there a way how we can connect all of them? We know that WM, so the entire length, is equal to WD plus DM. 
if we now rewrite this as WD is equal to WM minus DM, and we square both sides of this equation, we get WD squared is equal to WM squared plus DM squared minus 2WM times DM, we can see the following very interesting thing. We see that if we put all of the single terms on one side of the equality sign, we get WM squared plus DM squared minus WD squared is equal to 2 times WM times DM. And we see here, of course, that this left hand side is exactly what we have here. So we can simply substitute it by this term right here. And that is exactly what we will be doing right now. So we have that 2 times AM squared is equal to 2 times WM times DM. And we can of course drop these factors of 2 and we have the following equation. We have that AM squared is equal to WM multiplied by DM. And this equation will now help us to get the right formula. Because if we go back to our sketch, then we see that AM is simply equal to R. So we have that R squared is equal to, WM is the distance from W to M, and we see that it will be the following. From our original sketch, we see that WM is this length, which is R, plus capital H. It's simply the distance between the center of our sphere and the surface of our sphere, this is simply r, and of course the distance between the surface of our sphere and the point at which we are hovering, which is the distance capital H. So we get that r squared is equal to wm, but we've determined now that wm is simply the radius of our sphere plus the distance at which we are hovering. Now the only term that we are left with is this dm, and this dm of course is this distance right here. But as we just saw, we know that cm is the distance r, the distance from the center of the sphere to the surface of the sphere. So we know that this distance dm is simply r minus this distance c to d, exactly the distance which we were looking for. So this is r minus c d. And this formula is now exactly what we need, because now we can indeed find an expression for c d as a function of r and capital H. We simply rewrite this formula that we had right here, and we find that CD is equal to R minus R squared divided by R plus capital H, or written even differently, R times capital H divided by R plus capital H. And this is now exactly what we were looking for, because if we return to our formula that the surface of our spherical cap is equal to 2 pi times the radius of our sphere times cd, which is the distance h, then we can now simply fill this in. We have 2 pi multiplied by r multiplied by r capital H divided by r plus capital H, which is equal to 2 pi multiplied by r squared capital H divided by r plus capital H. And this is the formula that we were looking for. And now that we have found this formula, let's look at some examples to test whether it actually makes sense. To do this, we compare two scenarios. We're going to look at the proportion of the Earth's surface that you can see if you are standing in the middle of the ocean, so literally at sea level, and compare this with if you would be standing on the highest point on Earth, which is the summit of Mount Everest. Now to calculate this proportion, we of course first need to calculate the surface of the entire Earth. Now the surface of a sphere is simply 4 pi times r squared. And this with a radius equal to the radius of the Earth, which is approximately 6,300 kilometers, we get 511 million 185,932 square kilometers, which is gigantic. So this is the number with which we will be comparing our numbers. 
The first case is where we are standing at the ocean, so literally at sea level. So this means that our capital H, the height from which we are looking, is let's say 2 meters, since you're standing on a boat, which is approximately the height of your eyes. Filling in the formula, we find that S, as seen at the ocean, is equal to 2 pi multiplied by r squared, which is 6378 kilometers squared, times capital H, but capital H in this case is 2 meters, which is 0.002 kilometers, and we divide this by adding 0.002 kilometers to the radius of the Earth, which of course will be quite negligible. And if we do the calculation, we find this to be approximately 80 kilometers squared, which if we compare this with the surface of the entire Earth, is actually tiny. So even if you're standing in the middle of the ocean, it might look like you're viewing a large part of the Earth, you're actually looking at approximately 0.0000156% of the surface of the Earth. So how does this now compare when we are standing at the summit of Mount Everest? In this case, our capital H, so the height from which we are looking, is a bit higher. It is approximately 8 kilometers high. This means that the surface looked from Mount Everest is equal to 2 pi, multiplied again by the radius of the Earth squared, so 6378 kilometers squared, multiplied by 8 kilometers, divided by 6378 kilometers plus 8 kilometers. And doing this calculation, we find approximately 320,191 square kilometers, which is a surface that is approximately 4,000 times larger than if you would be standing at sea level. However, don't get your hopes up, because this is still a very tiny fraction of the total Earth's surface. It is exactly 0.062 percentage of the entire Earth's surface. So it doesn't matter how high you stand on the surface of the Earth, you will still only be able to see a tiny fraction of its total surface. Now an interesting thing to think about, of course, is what is the largest surface that you could possibly see? Well, this of course is the case when this age becomes near infinity. So if you're hovering infinitely far away from the Earth. Using some very fast limits, this means that this R can actually be dropped because it's very tiny in comparison with this capital H. If this R drops, this means that this H and this H can be cancelled out, and we are left with 2 pi times R squared. But this, of course, is exactly half of the surface of a sphere. And this, of course, makes sense because you can only at one point see exactly half of a sphere's surface. Unless, of course, it is hovering around a black hole, but that would be a story for another video. And this brings us to the end of this quite long video. If you made it all the way through the end, well, congratulations. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions, leave a comment in the comment section below. And if you want to get notified by future releases, consider subscribing. And with that, I thank you for sticking with me for all of this time, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.